many of you may have heard before, that has been called the prodigal son. Simple question. What does the word prodigal mean? Anybody know? The word prodigal. What does it mean? One who prods. One who prods. <laughs> I think. In my house, we'd say, good guess? No. <laughs> what does the word prodigal mean? Wayward in thought. Wayward in thought. Also, wasteful. When whatever you have is completely used wrong. Prodigal. One who took his substance. Let's look at the story. The Bible says in Luke 15, verse number 11, the Bible says, and he said, this is Jesus speaking to the scribes and Pharisees, verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave them to him. I'm going to stop reading there at the moment. A young man, where did this young man go wrong? Where did this young man go wrong? We start out with a story about a young man who comes to his father and says, Give me portion of goods that follows to me. Was there anything wrong with that? I can show you Bible verse after Bible verse where we ought to be going to the Father all the time for whatever is ours. Whatever he has for us. Give us this day our daily bread. He tells us, ask of me. Come to me and I will answer and show the great and mighty things he wants you to have what is yours. He wants you to. A lot of times in life, now, I will dis, I'm going to be honest with you, I disagree with a lot of people on this passage. Okay? I personally don't think that it's dealing with a lost man, an unsaved man, personally. I haven't seen that Amen. described in this passage at all. If it was, then you'd have to explain to me how the other brother was not lost as well. And I'm saved. I mean, I, I don't see that. There's a lot of people that will try to explain that this, these three stories are about salvation. I don't believe that because of the way that they're written and described. And I have one other reasoning for it. The chapter doesn't end with 15. We're going to go into chapter 16 because he continues his lesson. But that's a personal belief. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. I believe it's not dealing with a lost, unsaved individual. So I don't, here we have a young man who comes to his father and says, give me what comes to me. I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't believe there's anything wrong with you going to the father for anything that he has that is yours that he's holding for you. And then you go on a little bit further. Father divides into them, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. 
Ah, uh, here we have going off into the world. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Stop. Is there anything wrong with taking what the Father has given you and going into the world? Well, I can give you passages that say, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. The Bible does not condemn you for taking what he gives you, taking it with you into the world. As a matter of fact, you need what he gives you when you go into the world. And any true husbandman or farmer or property owner, any true one that divides their substance up to their children inheritance, wants their children to be able to use that to grow up and expand the family into the world. I believe there's nothing wrong with what the younger son did in getting his inheritance or going out into the world. I know where the problem lies. Where it says, and wasted his substance with righteous living and wasted his substance. You know, the reality is there's nobody within the bounds of this room right here. Nobody that has any more advantage over another from the inheritance that God has for you. Through salvation, you have what everybody else has. You get what everybody else gets. You get Jesus Christ and all he has to offer. There's nobody in here that has or gets any more. We all have the same substance from the Father. We all get it. The question comes down to what are we doing? What are we doing? Are we wasting it? Or are we using it? To, and I'm going to put it like this, expand the family business. It amazes me. How many men will start a company and it will grow and it will grow and it will grow Within just a few short years, it's a major corporation. Then the man passes away. And the children get their hands in it. And it crumbles and falls apart. They waste what their father has set up for them. It amazes me. How many times have we seen examples in people's lives where a man is a great example or testimony in that community. But his children turn out and he's like, what happened there? I think many times the problem lies in they waste their substance with righteous living. I made a statement. When I was a young man, probably about the fifth grade. No, I've had been older than that. Probably about the sixth or seventh grade. I made a statement one time. I was with some other kids. This, uh, this has stuck with me since that time. And these kids were all talking about different things. You know, and, you know, this, that, and the other. And I looked at him and I said, so my dad's a preacher. And I walked out of there. Because for some reason, something got my attention. I have no clue. Maybe, I, I really think somebody said something. I can't remember. But I walked out of there thinking, so what? What did you do to get in there? Mm -hmm. My first thought was, I was proud, honestly. 
My dad's a preacher. But when I walked out of there, I realized, so that doesn't mean anything for you. How are you living your life? Obviously, that bride just showed that you're not walking in his footsteps. And I think so many times we've been given, or we have the opportunity. The first problem many people have is they don't even go to the Father to get what he has for them. Secondly, when we do, we won't take it into the world and share it. And when we do take it into the world, we waste it. This young man, wasteful. I do want to go now to chapter 16. Because chapter 16 is a continued message. It did not end in chapter 15 where Jesus finished telling the story of the prodigal, wasteful son. In chapter 16 it says, and he said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward. The same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no, be no longer steward. And the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolving to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, In hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. And he said to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, In hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and write four score. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you to everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in that in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous man, who will commit to you your trust? The true riches. Jesus continues a thought, and I believe, personally, in chapter 15, 16, a thought is carried out throughout these chapters. I believe 15 has a special thought within those about the rejoicing in heaven over one who comes to repentance. I believe that is a key thought within that passage. Chapter 16 <clears throat> I believe still carries out the thought of losing things, being wasteful, but getting it back. And you see that Jesus is talking about this unjust steward who, in his mind, he is wasteful, obviously, with the master's goods, with the master's time. And the master says, you lose your right to work for me. And he says, oh, that's all I've known. That's all I've known. I better do something about this. And he makes some decisions. To change some things to show that he's not going to be wasteful anymore. I believe you can see a sign of repentance and change where he is finally commended by the master for his wisdom. And I don't believe he loses his job. It doesn't say that he does or doesn't. I do see that he gets commended. I believe that means he keeps it. We, and I don't have any points specifically to this message. I just want to bring out some things that I believe are very important in your life and mine as individuals, as believers, that God has given specific things to each and every one of us. But those specific things are not specific to individuals. They're specific through Jesus Christ. They're an inheritance that each and every individual through salvation has. And we have the opportunity. God gives us that faith. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us 
in understanding of the Word of God. Amen. Things that God gives to each and every one of us when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. He gives them to us. And many times, we either take them and hoard them, or we take them and waste them. A lot of times, we're just wasting our time and not using our inheritance like we ought to be for the Lord Jesus Christ. This unjust steward reminds me of many people today who I believe God has taken and said, wasted it long enough. And give account. Can't use you. I don't believe it means they've lost their salvation. You just can't use them anymore. And many people don't even realize. They're not even being used. My wife and I have talked about some people that we've known who served the Lord for years. And if you talked to them, you would truly believe that individual loved God so much. You saw talent in their life. You saw ability. You saw the blessings of God in their life. And they took those blessings and talents and they used them to serve the Lord in the world for a period of time. And then all of a sudden something happened. And they wasted it. And it amazes me if you'll study a believer that has served God, lived for God, who no longer works for God, how hard it is to get them to even realize they're no longer doing anything for God. They're so far, they don't even realize it. You talk to them and they will tell you, oh, I love the Lord. I'm living right. And you ask me, I, I talked to a young man who I went to a Christian school with. I went to a Christian school for two years. This young man, I talked to him. He came and worked with me. He said some things that were just off the wall Bible stuff that he had heard and I said interesting and then he came to the conclusion he said hey I know who the Antichrist is that caught my attention wouldn't they get your attention somebody told you they knew it and he's here and I said who is it and he told me who it was so now two of us on this world know who it is I'm not going to tell you. He told me who it was. And then he told me all the reasons that he knew it was. He told me about how the Bible taught this. And that guy matched up. How the Bible taught this. And the guy matched up. And the Bible taught this. And the guy matched up. And I said, that's amazing. I said, can I ask you a question? I said, knowing who the Antichrist is, since I now know. I, I, I played it out with him. Since I now know. And knowing that he's here now, that means Jesus coming in. Wouldn't that make me maybe more faithful to church? He said, oh, yeah. I said, don't you think that would make me more into reading my Bible and studying it? Yeah. So don't you think knowing that it is that close, the Antichrist already here, Make me maybe pray a little bit more? Don't you think that make me be a greater witness for Christ? I mean, I, it's a, it, the end is here. Yeah. I said, okay. Let's, let's go back to this past Sunday. I said, last Sunday I didn't know who the Antichrist was. Last Sunday I didn't know who it was. Um, last Sunday... I went to church. Last Sunday, I read my Bible. Last Sunday, I prayed. And last Sunday, I actually was able to witness to a few people. And so now that I know I have to be more of all that for Christ, right? Well, yeah, probably. I said, I've already asked you before all this conversation. Where were you last Sunday? You weren't in church. 
You already told me you didn't read your Bible. You already told me you don't pray as much. You already told me you don't tell others about Jesus. And you knew the Antichrist was. So how is it supposed to make me more of all this when it hasn't done that much for you? You're so much into what you think. You've actually wasted your inheritance, your substance with riotous living in this world. You don't even know where you're at anymore. You want to stand here at work and tell me how much closer I would be to the Lord if I knew the Antichrist was? I said, let me just tell you this. I can give you one Bible verse that tells you you don't know who the Antichrist is. Just one. Problem is, many of them are back like that young man in Luke 15. Well, here's where we get to. In verse 15. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. We're trying to work it out on our own now. Trying to work it out on our own now. I'm going to go work. I'm going to make it on my own. I'm going to earn my own way. Not against working for a living. Bible teaches that's what a man ought to do to take care of his family. Not to say anything against that. What I am saying is, you can't do things for God on your own. You can't do it on your own by yourself. You can't work it out for the family business, for the father's business, spiritually. You can't do it on your own. You need his substance that he divides to you. You need it to be able to expand his family business, the house of God, the work of God, the ministry. You need it. And this young man is trying to work it out his own. He's going to go. He's going to get a job. He's going to work it out. He's going to do things his way. And he finally comes to a realization. Verse 17, he came to himself. He said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bred enough in despair and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, listen to this, and will say unto him, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me. One more demand. Make me. As one of the hired servants. I make a big deal about that because when he goes to the father, he says, Verse number 21, the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned. All right, verse 16, he says, I will say, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of the hired servants. Verse 21 says, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Period. No more demands. No more make me. You do it. He just humbles himself and says, I don't deserve it. And the father, this is amazing. This is amazing. The father has divided unto both sons their inheritance at the beginning of the story. So let me ask you this. The father says, bring out the fatted calf, bring out a robe, bring out a ring. He's bringing stuff out for that son. Where is he getting it from? Is he taking it from the older son? Uh-uh. You see, the father never runs out. Amen. We're dealing with a story reflecting the heavenly father. Who even though he divides the inheritance up among his children, and you waste what he's given you. You get to a point in this world, you've gone into the world which you should be doing with his inheritance. And you should be using it to expand the family business, to witness for Christ, to expand the family, to win others to him, to bring them into the fold, to grow. You waste it. You come back to him. He doesn't look at you and say, sorry, I've already given you your inheritance. Father doesn't run out. 
and he can give you the inheritance right back again because he doesn't run out. So here's what I'm getting to tonight. What are we doing with our life? What are we doing? Are there things in our life that we say, I've failed. I can't get it back. I will have to point out, the Father has divided the same inheritance to you as everybody around you. But he didn't run out of anything. He can still give back to you what you need to get his work done, his family built, his work accomplished. I've seen so many churches that when they lose one family or one member, the church says, we don't know how we can go on. Mm -hmm. The father doesn't run out of resources. He doesn't run out of any of his substance. I am so amazed so amazed at the how God works in different areas and avenues of life. God has blessed our church in Oklahoma so greatly in the last few months. I mentioned it before, and I'll say it again. I've actually told my pastor Thankfully, the church was able to take him on full-time recently. And I told him, I said, when we leave, when we go up to Missouri, the amazing thing is, I don't believe it's going to hurt the church at all. In any way. Because in the last six months, God has brought people in Find it, people that have abilities and talents that can teach and sing and play instruments. They can, people that tithe, people that give, people that go door. God has brought so many things together in the last six months that when we step out, other than our presence, God's already filled every single one of those resources. Amen. Churches need it. Here's the reality. There may be some people that sit in church today. I don't know your personal life completely. But maybe there's something in your life that you wasted. That you're not doing for God. That you look at someone else and you say, Man, they're gone. Now we can't do this. The same resources, the same substance is there for you. And maybe God has that for you to be able to step into that position and help out and do it. There's no one person in this room that can do everything. I talked to a young man, or a gentleman, I say young man, he's actually a lot older than me. I work for a box company, and he told me, he said, I remember when I ran every machine at this company from the start to finish. He said, I would run the machine that made the paper, and then I'd go run the machine that cut the paper, and I'd run the machine that printed the paper, and I'd run the entire thing. Now it's a business that there's 30, 40 people it takes, and I'm talking about non-stop motion to keep all that going. He couldn't even do part of it by himself hardly. It's expanded. I don't know what it is in your life, or how you are. But if there's something in your life that you just say, I can't do it anymore. Trust me, God has the resources. He hasn't run out, and he won't run out. He can use you to accomplish his work and his will. And he wants each and every one of us to take what he has for us, the inheritance. And he wants us to take that into the world and expand the family, family business. So as we go forward, I'm going to pray, 
And I hope that you will pray with me. That you might not have the talent, you might think, or ability like somebody else has to do something. But I'm going to pray that each and every one of you personally finds that place where God has for you not just to be in the church, but to be a benefit to expand the family of God, to be a witness and a testimony wherever and however He so chooses. And I mentioned to the men, when they were questioning me, I would like, personally, to be able to take every man out door knocking and go visiting with everyone. I didn't say everyone had to speak. I'd like that. That we could work together to expand the family of Jesus Christ. Witnessing in this community, telling others about Jesus. Ladies, God has stuff for you. I'll tell you what, I'm not going to complain about the meal. I think He used you greatly in the food. I enjoyed that. Whatever God has for you, don't think that God has set you aside. God has a substance that when He divides His inheritance up among all of His children, He doesn't run out. Say, how does He do that? I don't know. But when I get to heaven, I'll find out. Because mm -hmm. even when we speak, we find out. But He's got it. Whatever we do in our life, we don't want to be wasteful. You need something? Ask the Lord for it. You know someone in the world that needs it? Take your substance in the world and use it for His honor and glory. If you've already wasted it, and be like the prodigal son, go back. I messed up. He said, let's start all over. Come on. And he'll walk with you. Take care of you. Give it to you. One story, and I'm going to finish with it. Had the children sing a song about the wise man and the foolish man. Can you tell me, can you tell me what one substance, what one substance, this is a trick question, that one of them had to use over the other? Do you have a wise man and a foolish man? One man was wise, one man was foolish. Why did the wise man's work not fail and the foolish man's work fail? What was lacking in the foolish man's life? What resource was lacking? And I'll have to tell you this, it's a trick question. Nothing was lacking. Nothing was lacking. He could have built on the foundation the same as the other. It wasn't that he built on the sand because he was foolish. He was foolish because he did not build on the foundation that was already available. Mm -hmm. They could have built houses. I told I, I tell the children the story about two brothers, two twin brothers who go out. And I, I make up a story about two twin brothers. They go out and they build these houses. They, get, they go to the same contractor. They get the same exact blueprint. They buy the same exact lumber from the same company. Same nails, same screws. And they build identical houses. One of them fails. Two brothers, same family, both mentality, both educated, both smart. Problem is, one of them did not use one resource that was still available. The foundation of Jesus Christ. It's not that it wasn't available to him. He did not use it. That shows foolishness. Every resource that any person, you look at someone and say, well, they have, they might, it might look like they have another talent. I'll be honest with you, I can't play the piano. I can't play the organ. I'm pretty good for the kazoo player. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have those talents. I haven't put as much time into it either. If I felt like it, I probably could 
become somewhat of a little bit of a pianist. The reality is, God doesn't call everybody to do everything. He gives you the resources to do what He wants you to do. It's available. If you wanted to be a musician, you probably could. Don't waste the resources that He has for you. And if you've already wasted them, go back to Him. Because He still has to run out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God. Lord, I know that many times we get to where we're so busy in life that we forget even to rely on you. Sometimes we don't even, we even tell people about you and witness for you without you even being involved in it. Because we are not relying on you, we're relying on our memory, our ability, and our talent. Lord, you've given us the resource of the Holy Spirit. You've given us the Word of God. You've given us so much, Lord. I pray that you would help us to be faithful, to use what you have given us through your strength, your power, and also through that faith that you've given us as well. To use those talents, the abilities, the resources, the substance that you've given us to go into the world and expand what you would have for us to do for the cause of Christ, not for our own personal self-pleasure and enjoyment. But Lord, ultimately, we know we will be happy and pleased when we stand before you face to face, and you can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, maybe we're like that unjust steward. Maybe we've already wasted a lot. And maybe it looks like that you're done, you're about to stop using us. Lord, may we take to heart the thought that the Bible gives us that we can get back to where you would use us. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, your patience with us, your long-suffering. Thank you. In your name I pray.